Good evening. You're watching the Digital Age, and I'm James Goodale. You know, the New York Times published a leak that the NSA was tapping phones in the United States. It caused a great furor. President Bush was very angry at the New York Times. A grand jury has been convened to investigate the New York Times. The question for us tonight is, will President Bush indict the New York Times? And here to discuss that question with us is Gabe Schoenfeld, who is the senior editor of Commentary Magazine, and Mary Rose Papandrea, who is an assistant professor at Boston College. Now, we're going to introduce the subject with some video. There can be no excuse for anyone entrusted with vital intelligence to leak it, and no excuse for any newspaper to print it. Some in the press, in particular the New York Times, have made the job of defending against further terrorist attacks more difficult by insisting on publishing detailed information about vital national security programs. Representative Peter King went beyond mere rhetoric. He wrote a letter to the Attorney General formally requesting that the Times be investigated for possible criminal prosecution under the Espionage Act. Gabe Schoenfeld, you have achieved fame and even notoriety with an article you wrote in Commentary magazine. You are the senior editor of Commentary, in which you effectively said that under the, under the existing laws that are out there, uh, the New York Times should be indicted. Can you tell us what your position is? Well, <clears throat> as you said in the setup, there is a federal grand jury investigating the leak to the New York Times. I don't think the New York Times itself is being investigated at this point, at least from my discussions with people at the Times, I haven't heard that, they've, that anyone has been called. But the fact is that we are at war, that the Times learned of a highly sensitive program, counterterrorism program, published it on the front page, compromised the program, leading members of Congress, including leading Democrats, Jane Harman, ranking Democratic member of the House Intelligence Committee, said that the newspaper uh, inflicted cri uh, critical damage to a vital national intelligence program. Now, there are laws on the books that make this kind of thing punishable. They've never been used against the newspaper. But we are in a very dangerous situation. There are al-Qaeda terrorists who are determined to strike us again. The Times, this is not the only leak by, of of very sensitive counter-terrorism counter secrets that the Times has put on the front page of its paper. And uh, I think a, a strong argument can be made for moving ahead with some sort of criminal prosecution of the paper. Well, let's come back and, and, and talk with Gabe uh, about the part of his article that uh, produced this statute, which he talked about, which has never been used. Uh, it has a number, I don't know, the audience 798? Has, I don't think the audience has one? to, uh, an audience has to use the, uh, know what the number is. Uh, you've been looking into this. Oh, sure. I remember even, reading Gabe's article on the airplane, I think it was uh, just about a year ago, and I thought, oh my goodness, I just, I hadn't really thought about it. But, you know, first of all, well, we you should... You know what you told me first. You well, I'm being nice. I'm being nice. I was you very know, upset. You know what you told me first? You said, that can't possibly be right. Right. Well, I was surprised. I mean, I was surprised. And I think Gabe, um, one thing that Gabe struck upon, which I think is absolutely right, is that uh, this one section, I don't mean to confuse the viewers by pointing out section numbers, but there is this one provision, section 798, that uh, specifically uh, criminalizes the publication of certain specific types of information, including uh, intelligence communications information. And so there are other provisions of the Espionage Act, which uh, don't use the word publish, are uh, much broader. And so I thought Gabe was, uh, was quite right to point out that on the face of it, Section 798 could possibly be used against the New York Times if you just took the statute on its face and did not consider some of the constitutional infirmities of that statute. Well, so the Gabe, then, then Gabe is right, and he really has made a, a reputation for himself in some respects. And, and going, he's not, Gabe's not a lawyer, so we... We don't want to, you are a lawyer, obviously. I would never have guessed yes. he wasn't and a lawyer. Someone has said that in, in some time in my past I was a lawyer. <laughs> so it's unfair for us to gang up on Gabe because he's, he's, he isn't a lawyer. 
I'll but do my best to defend myself. You do your best, okay. I think he's, he can do it. He can do it, okay. But uh, he made his fame uh, with regard to this particular instance by flipping through the code book and coming upon this section that says, as you just told me, that it can be a crime to publish. And I don't know, were you surprised? Were you surprised to find that? Because as Mary Rose I was, said, I was very surprised. Let yeah. me tell you a little bit how I came to this yeah. thing, which is uh, basically a pretty new subject to me. I was reviewing James Risen's book. Uh, James Risen is a New York Times reporter who, one of the two reporters who broke the story about the right. NSA wiretapping program, right. which is not a domestic wiretapping program as you, as you described it in well, the setup, but an international wiretapping program okay. designed to get communications across borders. Anyway, I was reviewing this book, and the question that popped into my mind is. Is it legal to disclose these kinds of vital secrets? And I dug out this absolutely fascinating, path-breaking article by Benno Schmidt and Harold Edgar and read it in a kind of fever. And the more I read, the, the more I became convinced that it was not possible to prosecute a newspaper for publishing this kind of material until I got to the very end. And there's this long discussion of this one area governing cryptographic and communications intelligence where it became pretty clear uh, that this statute applied to this set of facts. And what's more, Schmidt and, and Edgar, who were both kind of liberal lawyers, described this statute as a model of clarity uh, compared to the Espionage Act, which is, as everyone I think here would agree, is a very opaque mess. And in fact, um, as I think, Gabe, you've mentioned in your various writings on 798, it was passed um, based on concerns specifically about the publication of a book that would reveal that we were breaking foreign uh, crypto cryptographic codes. And so there actually was very specific motivation for the passage of that stat statute. And it was not an accident that Congress included the word publish in that particular statute. Right, now, and Benno Schmidt, to whom you referred, is not just plain old Benno Schmidt. He's Benno Schmidt, who was then a Columbia Law professor. Then he became the dean of Columbia Law School, and then the president of Yale. So, I mean, it's just not any old Benno Schmidt who's saying that this section is a, a model of clarity. But as Mary Rose says, uh, it seems that uh, it's fair to say, is it? Let's see what you think of this. That this uh, section of, of the law that you found, uh, with the help of Benno, is aimed at stopping the uh, breaking of codes. What do you think about that comment? It's aimed at, one of the things is the stopping the breaking of codes. No, it's aimed at publishing information g pertaining to our efforts to, to break codes, intercept communications of foreign powers, and I think terrorist organizations would fall under the definition of foreign powers as far as I understand it. So uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly specific sp statute, but this is this New York Times story, I wonder if you disagree, uh, would seem to fall under, under its... Um, I mean, from my discussion with the Times about it, uh, people at the Times, lawyers at the Times, their basic position is, well, we broke this statute, but the statute is probably uh, unconstitutional. I'd love to have a test of that question. Uh, maybe well, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you've noted, uh, not many people contest that this doesn't fall within the statute. There's perhaps some argument that we weren't, that the New York Times was not actually revealing any new method or procedure since the use of wiretapping was well known. Um, but I don't think that's the strongest argument. I do think that you're quite right. If, th if this actually did go forward, if the government actually did try to prosecute the New York Times, their defenses would rest mainly on constitutional well, grounds. Well, let's, let's, let me put the question to you sure. again. Again, sure. uh, do you think the New York Times broke the law as the law is stated here? Yes or no? As stated there, yes. Yeah, as, as, <laughs> so you know, so well, Gabe is right. The, the New York Times New York Times broke the law. Yeah, but it's an unconstitutional law. Oh, but that's law. different. Well, yeah. that but, is a very, but, I mean. But that's different. That, right? I mean, and I, who is the arbiter in our system of justice of what is constitutional and what is not? My, my impression, it was the courts and prosecutors and not the editors of the New York Times. So what you're saying is that the Times editors have arrogated to themselves the right to determine what the law is. Or they're, or they're engaging in civil disobedience. Well, when it comes to the First Amendment, I mean, how, how do you go about challenging a law you think is unconstitutional? You could try to bring a declaratory judgment act, but given well, the near... that's fancy talk. It's but, very... I'm but, sorry, but, but sorry. declaratory judgment. You know, go I mean, to court and get a declaration yeah, right, that this is okay. an unconstitutional law. However, that would involve a lot of time. Uh, when they... I mean, they did sit on the story for a year, well, but that see, would keep them... let me just stop you, because what you're... See, Gabe is saying, well, 
you know, is the time supposed to decide itself? It's, it's constitutional, and your answer is, well, the only thing you could do would go to ask a court before publication whether it was constitutional, and then I cut you off, and you're probably going to say that's not really r realistic. Yeah, that's not a realistic yeah. way of doing it. The the delay that that would uh, that that would entail would just be uh, really difficult for the Times. That is such a timely story. Well, let me just ask you. You know, there are so many restrictions on newspapers that are that are accepted as a matter of law. We have local mm -hmm. restrictions on libel and commercial speech. Here we have this vital national security questions, and the Times is free to publish these very sensitive secrets that tip that tip off our adversaries about our, the ways we're tracking them, that doesn't make sense to me. And I would bet that the court would uphold the statute. Well, I, I just well, want to, I, I see, I thought that was the argument you were going to make before. I think it's a very different argument to say, well, should the New York Times be the one to decide what would uh, undermine our national security versus to say, is it up to the New York Times to decide what's constitutional and not constitutional? Yeah, let's let's uh, deal with both questions, of yeah. course. But uh, let's finish our conversation on, on the first one. Right. Uh, you teach... What do you teach? I teach constitutional oh, law, you teach media constitutional law, law, civil procedure. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of a leading question, but uh, isn't it true that there are lots of uh, laws on the books that you come up up against? You know, that say you can't publish this, you can't print that. Oh, sure, and they're and, struck down all and, the time. And it, all the time. Is it unusual? I'm not saying every time they're right. struck down, yeah. but yes, it's quite common yeah. for the Supreme Court or, or a lower court to hold that a law is unconstitutional. Right. So, but it, sort of helping you out against Gabe, you don't need any help, but so it's not that unusual, is it, for a publishing company to look at laws that say that and say that oh, the heck with it? Uh, you know, sure, that's what they have their lawyers yeah. for. Well, let's, let's uh, I want to get to this, the, the other question mm -hmm. that Gabe is raising. But I think is, that's a very... Well, I think yeah, that's uh, the central, yes, this is the yeah, central but, question, but and, wanna, the, and the most important precedent, of course, is the Pentagon Papers case. Right. And there, the court said, you know, this was a, the Pentagon Papers case was, of course, prior restraint case. But what does that mean, prior restraint? They were trying to stop the, the paper from publishing the story before it came out. Right. But it, the court, in various, in the dicta that were issued by the justices in that decision, the, a number of them, including Justice White, said that, well, if this came to us as a criminal prosecution after they had published it, we would definitely vote to, you know, to convict if any of this material in this Pentagon Papers documents were of the, were of the nature of 798 material, in other words, communications intelligence, which was specifically singled out. Well, so in other words, the Pentagon Papers case was uh, we, we stopped the uh, paper from publishing before it had a chance to publish. But now it's different. We're having a criminal prosecution, and you point out that uh, the judges said you could have criminal prosecutions. Of course, the only thing is uh, we don't know what kind of criminal prosecution to have because we've never, we've never had one. Uh, but let's go to the to the question that he he raised uh, that brought on that constitutional exegesis. Uh, is it appropriate for the for something a publication such as the New York Times to arrogate to itself the decision to publish something that damages national security? To put it in, in the best terms, for Gabe's point of view. Well. There's so many different ways I want to respond to that. But first of all, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind in um, the background of this discussion is that uh, leaks, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, background briefings, leaks, trial balloons, are happening all the time, every day. And the press publishes them sometimes and sometimes doesn't. But this is how the world works. The government and the press are in this very symbiotic relationship where the press depends on the government to provide it with news and the government very much depends on the press to publicize its uh, its initiatives. Uh, and so that's one thing we have to keep in mind. So the, the, the press has published many, many, many leaks and they are most of the time, I would say 99.5 percent of the time, no one makes to stink about it because it's just part of the way we do business. And so when it happens that the New York Times or uh, any other publication has received information about a possibly, I say definitely, illegal uh, government operation, that it is fully within its rights to reveal that operation to the American people. Well, see, the, the, the way she uh, answers your, your question is she doesn't really ask herself, but we can ask her, did this damage national security? She says that what the New York Times was publishing was the fact that what the government was doing was illegal. And therefore, because it was illegal, that justifies in some part the 
publication. Would you agree well, that, the, that, that this action by the government was illegal? Well, I don't agree that it was illegal. I think you know, it's before the courts now. There is a judge, who, a federal judge, who did find it illegal, but I think all bets are that that's going to be overturned. It's my bet. Uh, if the program were definitely illegal and transparently illegal, I would have no problem with the New York Times publishing it. But let me ask you uh, about uh, yeah. But um, I, I think here, this is from what the Times itself was able to report about the program, this was no runaway program like we saw in Watergate. Members of Congress had been briefed about this program on more than 30 separate occasions. It had been reviewed by separate attorneys in separate, several different government departments. Uh, this was not a runaway program. Congress had been, was in the loop on this one. It was a vital program for our national security. And it, as, as so many government officials testified after, after the Times disclosed it, the actual disclosure harmed our ability to intercept al-Qaeda communications. Well, I want to get to the harm point, yeah. but uh, on the question of whether it was illegal or not, I mean, there is a law that was passed because of uh, s some part of this activity occurring before, back in the late 60s, I believe. And the law says that you can't do what the government did. Uh, I mean, w would you agree with that? Would you then agree that the, the next part uh, what the government would say is, well, that's what the law says, but that law is not constitutional. <laughs> Talking well, about I, yeah, arrogating well, constitutionality, well, I think that's there not because is, there is the executive question, yeah. has the right to do it anyway. There is, there is a question about the constitutionality of the FISA Act that restrict that some people allege restricts the yeah. government. From, what does FISA mean? FISA is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It set up a whole series of procedures to, to, to govern wiretaps yeah. really more in a, in a kind of uh, criminal context rather than a counterterrorism context. Uh, the, the administration, for reasons that elude me, did not uh, seek to uh, amend the uh, FISA Act when it launched this program. Yeah. It, just, it launched it, but I mean, I've heard uh, very smart lawyers, including Floyd Abrams, say, "Well, this plausibly, uh, under the, just the Article II powers of the of, uh, of the president, uh, is, is uh, something that the, the court would uphel, uphold." We well, won't no. know. Until well, now the, you know the Bush administration is famous for talking about its executive power. Right. It has executive power to. Uh, uh, deal with Guantanamo and has executive power to do this and that and Cheney says we need more executive power because as a consequence of Vietnam the executive was was uh, uh, denigrated uh, would it be your view that uh, the Bush administration has executive power just to go ahead with this program and that uh, the argument that I made and I think you made that it was illegal is all wrong no, I, I think it's plainly illegal for the reasons you were stating earlier. There is, in fact, a uh, Congress has passed a statute, passed legislation that authorizes the president to conduct wiretapping in certain circumstances. We have a um, secret court that hears these uh, applications for warrants. They are almost in t always granted. Um, we don't really know much about it. In fact, it's funny, when I taught my first class on civil liberties and national security, we argued about whether FISA was constitutional, not because it restricted yeah, no, the FISA, president. You know, the FISA well, is where that but, but now yeah. with these exp uh, you know, extended powers, uh, it was quite, quite surprising. But I wanted to get back to what you are saying about the executive um, being in charge of national security. I think that um, we have to keep in mind that just because we trot out the phrase national security doesn't mean that the public has no interest in finding out about that kind of information. It's very crucial. It's very much in the public's interest. Here we are fighting a war where thousands of, of uh, people are dying. It was very much part of the election uh, referendum on the, the, on the c conduct of this war. And so just the, the fact that national security is an interest doesn't mean that the executive should have carte blanche to decide what the public hears and what the public doesn't hear. The public, yeah, the, the public also has a right to have its government keep its secrets from its adversaries. But let's talk about this uh, last point you yeah. made, because I've heard you say on previous occasions in a, a very interesting way that what's the war against terrorism about? It's a war of t intelligence. That's right. Okay, we're so therefore, therefore, if we're going to have any idea how this uh, war is being fought as to its effectiveness, how it's being done, uh, doesn't the public have to know more about intelligence than it knows today? And from your side, from your side, because you're a journalist, don't you have an obligation to tell the public more about how the intelligence operations well, of the United States? Because a, there's no way to make a judgment. It's a great question, but we, you know, we elect our, these representatives and we entrust them, in some cases, with things that we ourselves as citizens cannot learn about because they're too important. Yeah, but where do you draw the line? Well, it's a, it's a tough case. But it's, a very, it's political, and if we don't trust our representatives, we, we 
to get rid of them. Okay. I have some suggestions. Yeah. One thing I, I bet Gabe and I would agree on is that um, the government is entitled to punish government employees or uh, government contractors who leak this information. And the Supreme Court has been more than willing to uphold restrictions on employee speech. And so here what we're dealing with is when the leak occurs, can the government punish the New York Times or another publication for publishing that information? So I think it's important to keep that in mind because we're not saying the government is helpless, that all of the information about intelligence should come out because I think everyone would agree some intelligence information should remain secret. The question is, when well, we're going to restrict the publication, we have to have a very, very important reason for restricting that publication, not just that there might be a threat, but I would use the standard from the Pentagon Papers case that it has to be um, a, an immediate and irreparable grave threat to well, national security. Well, that security. was a standard for prior restraint, and of course this is after the fact, and so a different standard well, might well, apply. Well, but I, do, I agree with you that in general, in these matters, the government does have a right and a responsibility to go after the leakers who are breaking their oaths to, to maintain secrecy, and that prosecution of the press should be a last resort. But I think with the Times is itself behaved quite recklessly uh, with national security secrets. Okay, but, but Mary, uh, Gabe, uh, uh, Mary Rose raises sort of the key question, uh, which is another way of asking, where do you draw the line, okay? And so we have to recognize, whether we like it or not, classified information is all over the place. You publish it. You have said. Yes, that's right. And, 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 uh, I, would and the, I would draw the line in a very clear place, exactly okay. where the law is. Okay, we have these laws on the books. And, and no, by the way, if those were bad laws, I think the Times and others, like critics like yourself, should work to change those laws. Uh, but uh, but uh, we shouldn't violate the law. We should respect the law. Even when it, even when it's, you know what this says? Uh, well, how about, look what this says here. It says that the New York Times or anybody else can't publish any information about communications intelligence activities of the United States. Classified. Classified. Oh, okay, classified. That's an important well, modifier but okay, there. Okay, fine, fine. Classified. Yes. Uh, that's an awfully broad it, statement. It, it, I want to show something up to the camera, <laughs> just to make my point. This is the cover of a book called The Puzzle Palace. It was written by James Bamford, who has been a guest on this uh, program many times. It is a story about Communication, classified communications intelligence and how it's put together at the place where all this stuff emanates, National Security Agency, NSA for short. The uh, NSA was, went crazy when this came out and they were going to throw them into jail and now they're embracing them because they think they got uh, good PR. Uh, but would your view be that this book should never have been published? Well, I think there's also got, has to be a matter of discretion uh, in the government about when to when to prosecute. When, I, I don't know the publication date of that book, but I, I, I'm pretty certain it was before September 11th. Uh, we're now in a new situation where we've been struck on our homeland. We suffered thousands of casualties here in the city. Um, I think we need to be uh, more guarded in the way we treat these classified information. It was a different era, and uh, we had more lax standards. Well, do you agree with this uh, idea that? Gabe has that if a, you don't like a, an overbroad statement, such as the one I've read, or indeed one that recently John Kyle, who is a senator from Arizona, Arizona yes. who has called for the Times prosecution, has uh, uh, an amendment he's made to the law we're talking about, in which he said that uh, you can't really talk about anything that uh, describes the national defense against terrorism. That's awfully broad. You couldn't talk about, uh, you know, any of our defense mm -hmm. operations. Do you think that's that's a good answer to this? In other words, he's saying to just you don't lobby like, against if the you don't laws. like you don't like the language, and if you don't want to go to court because it's impractical, then he's saying, well, go to Congress and get it changed. Well, that is always a, a good option if it, if it can happen. And so the uh, I'm sure the press will be fighting the Kyle Amendment. I have no doubt that they'll. And I've seen some uh, publications already arguing against it. So they'll know, it's not that they are not trying. Um, but, you know, with this provision, the 798 provision, sorry to mention the code section again, um, it has never been used against the press. Um, and, uh, and when any other <coughs> parts of the Espionage Act have been used against uh, those who have provided information to the press, which is the closest we have, um, to this kind of situation. The press has vigorously um, fought, filed amicus briefs and really fought against that. So they are not ignoring the courts and they're not ignoring 
Congress, uh, but they can't just be forced to sit back if there is, in fact, an unconstitutional law on the books. They have every right to bring it to the courts and get a resolution. Your argument depends on your judgment, in some part, that the publication of this information by the New York Times was damaging to national security. I mean, that's basically your argument. The argument that's made against that is that we, uh, we told the terrorists that their phones were being tapped. It's probably much more sophisticated than that, that their emails were being read, uh, so forth and so on. Yes, that's true, but they already knew it. Well, yes and no. Uh, I mean, they, they knew in a general way that we were wiretapping, that we were trying to wiretap them. They didn't know about the scope of the program that was revealed by the Times in this December 16, 2005 story. And then immediately after, in a series of other stories and in, the, in this book by James Risen that went into much greater detail about the way we were, we were intercepting. And what's more, uh, putting this program uh, on the front page of the paper had to have the effect, it's obvious, of alerting al-Qaeda operatives who may or may not be rock rocket scientists. Just look at Zacharias Massawi, look at Richard Reed. These guys, are, some of them have their screws loose. They might, um, they might, but they might have picked up the New York Post and seen that, um, that we were doing this and, um, and stopped uh, using phones. Uh, you mean screws loose because they didn't think the government was already no, well, they're not, they're not exactly sophisticated He's operatives. He's saying not rocket scientists. Would your view yeah. be that, I assume the, the that government they're not is rocket scientists? Oh, I don't know about that. I think they're pretty sophisticated. Some of them, but not, not the low-level operatives in every case. Well, I, 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 the thing is that I assume the government is surveilling me. Just after 9-11, the government, and I, there's no particular reason I should disclose why the government should be <laughs> going what? after me, but I just assume, I mean, after 9-11, the government took such uh, aggressive efforts to fight terrorism that it wouldn't surprise me that they were surveilling, they were doing extraordinary rendition. I mean, they were just doing everything possible. And so I don't think the New York Times story really would have tipped them off to anything. All right, well, they look, we come know. to the end. We haven't even discussed the question. Do you think... Do you think that the, gov uh, the uh, government is going to indict the Times? I don't think so. I think as a political matter, it's very unwise to pick a fight with those who buy ink by the barrel. So uh, the Times uh, buys ink by the barrel, and uh, the Bush administration is gonna, not going to go after them. Well, that's because they lost the election. Do you think they would have gone after them if they hadn't lost the uh, election? I think if they, were gonna, if they were going to do it, they would have done it, they would have done it. around the time that the story it. came out or within the next right. six months. I, I think this is not a live issue right now. So your article is down the drain? No. No, I that's think not I've, fair. I've, I hope that I've created a bit of a chilling well, effect. Well, you have. A chilling effect. <laughs> yes. So you created a great <laughs> TV program. Thanks a lot, Gabe, for coming by. And uh, will the government indict the New York oh, Times? Oh, I don't think so. They've said publicly they're going after the leakers. But it's just one more time. Every time we're in a time of crisis, the government goes through this little dance with the press. And so we're just going through it again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Mary Rose for coming by. It's a by. pleasure. And thank you for coming by. And come by next week and learn more about the digital age. For the digital age, I am James Goodale. Good night. <laughs>